Good evening. I know it's just a tad before six o'clock, but we're going to be singing. And as people come in thinking they're late and discover they're early, that not that the way this whole day has operated anyhow? Am I not correct on that? Uh, we'll just blame it on daylight savings time, all right? So we'll get started just a tad early, and let me tell you it'll all work out. We're going to begin by singing hymn 129. Welcome you with us on the live stream and we'll welcome you again at the top of the hour maybe at the cross and I'll ask you to stand the way the schedule works tonight I need you to stand as we begin our service hymn 129 at the cross is the hymn we're going to sing all the verses all four verses I'm going to pray in just a moment. Again, I'll welcome those who've joined with us on the live stream. I want to go over the order of service. Basically, we have two complete services tonight. And this first section, I'm calling it that, it works as you've just heard. We sing the opening hymn at the cross. I'll have prayer. I'll have you be seated. I'll make some announcements. We're going to take our church offering. If you came prepared for only one offering tonight, we would ask that you forego this one and then take care of the next offering that I'm going to mention in a moment. So after the announcements and offering, we'll have one more hymn, and then we'll go right into the Lord's Supper. And I'll read from Scripture as we normally do, and we'll go right into uh, the Lord's Supper. That will, will conclude the first section. At that moment in time, we're going to hand the pulpit and the platform over to the uh, missionary, the speaker of the hour, and uh, give him the privilege to handle the second section however he pleases. You can see that there's a presentation, and he's going to take the word of God as well. And however he wants to do that is on him, and he will run the service from that moment on until he's complete or satisfied. Um, and he checked. He wanted to make sure that you'd be happy if we were done somewhere around 10 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> yes, you heard the laughter. They are very happy with that. 
So after that, I will come back and we will have the second offering, the love offering that uh, we will uh, take up for him. So that kind of sets the tenor of our, our service tonight and you have a feel for where we're headed and where we are. Let us open in prayer and ask the Lord to bless all of this. And Father, as we begin now our service, we ask that you bless this time, and that whatever it is we do and however that it is done, that it would honor our Savior. We thank you we have a very special service tonight in relationship to the remembrance of what you did for us at the cross. And Lord, I pray that the, the, the business of the night would not distract or deflect from the moment this, this is. And then as we hear how the gospel is being used elsewhere, as we get the privilege to pray and to support from afar, uh, uh, the work of redemption uh, going forward, I pray that our hearts would be stirred there as well. In all of this, may our Savior be pleased, and I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and I invite you to continue singing as we go to hymn 127, not far away from where we were. All five verses, hall hallelujah, oh, what a Savior. the schedule a little bit there you will have to excuse uh, I needed to get a grip <laughs> I want to make these several announcements at this moment we have 543 cans of corn so if you still are planning to bring some that's okay we'll just have the vehicle that's to haul them make a couple trips uh, so that nothing breaks down or gets hurt um, but uh, uh, we have hit the, the goal of 500 that we needed for the uh, rescue mission, and anything now, I suppose, will be bonus. But uh, if you still intend to bring, that's okay, that's acceptable. I want to remind you that uh, the uh, ladies have a meeting on a week from Monday, and it's setting up the, the Thanksgiving um, uh, meal. This morning I didn't say much about it, but I want to remind you that the meal comes right after the morning service. On the 20th of Thanksgiving, or Thanksgiving, the 20th of November, the Thanksgiving dinner will be after the morning service. And then we will have our evening service in the afternoon over at the other building. And uh, I want you to be aware of how the schedule changes a little bit. 
that means there will not be an evening service on the 20th. It will have been done at the mealtime. Okay, is that clear? Have I muddied the waters? Then I want you to know, related to that, all sorts of sign-ups in the back uh, foyer. On the 14th of November, also, we have uh, a concrete pour. And uh, all of you who are feeling agile and up to it, and those of you who aren't, are welcome to come and participate in this. We're estimating the pour to be about 10 yards, and that's nothing. That's a cakewalk, right? A piece of cake. I'm watching some people say in the meeting over there that it's not a piece of cake, but it can be. Pray. All right, the 14th, that's in the morning, and I'm working that all day. Um, so far, the people have talked to me are sending their regrets. So please change the tune on this a little bit. Um, then I think that's all I'm going to say by way of announcement. What's going to happen now is we're going to take our, morning, our, our church offering, and after we take the church offering, I will come up here and read scripture and go into the Lord's Supper. So we'll ask our men to come. Uh, we'll have prayer and take the offering. As I mentioned this morning, our prayer today is for the Matthias. I told you they'd be here, and it'd be very appropriate for us to be praying for them and their ministry. And Father, as we now take the church offering, we pray that you'd bless it, even as you have uh, done mark, uh, remarkably through the years. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. May we reflect well upon that. Please, I pray, uh, bless this, the gift, the giver, those unable or unprepared. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As I said, I'm just going to simply read these verses, and then there'll be a time of quiet prayer. And then we'll ask our men to come, and we'll deliver the elements here tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the passage we regu regularly read to the Lord's Supper. And... Uh, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him 
eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. I ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word here. And as it says, we have a, t a period here of self-examination. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a few moments here to consider before the Lord your heart's condition. And then after that, we'll ask our men to come and we'll distribute the elements. Let us pray. And Heavenly Father, as we continue in a spirit of prayer, as we weigh ourselves carefully uh, before you and your most holy righteousness, pray that we will partake in this part of the service in a worthy fashion and bring great honor to our Savior, to whom honor is much due. Uh, bless uh, this service as we go forward and as we remember what you have done for us uh, and paid such a high price that we would be so careful and cautious. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for your mercy. And I pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. We'll ask our men to come. And as we normally do, we ask you to move towards the center. As, as we would continue to the second section, you can move back to where you're seated if you want to. Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. I we'll ask Brother Lynn to lead us into prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come, humbly come before you, we give you thanks for your great love.
And after the same manner, he took the cup when they had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. I'll ask Brother Aaron to lead us into prayer. Father, we thank you again for the sacrifice you made, Lord. We thank you for taking our sins upon you on the cross. Lord, we thank you so much for the freedom that we have in that, Lord, and the victory that we have over hell and the grave. Thank you so much for that, Lord, and we praise you for that. I pray that you would help us, Lord, even as already mentioned, Lord, that we would live in light of that every day. Help us to be a testimony and a witness for you, Lord. Help us to glorify you in our lives. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Amen. back to the places you were more comfortable in or were more at home. I don't want to mess up your pew section or your pew place, but as you do move, if you do, I would like to introduce the speaker. Uh, Brother Mattia has served the Lord all his life in, in Germany, and um, probably he would admit to even before he knew the Lord as a Savior, he was used in some form or fashion to do some things for the Lord. It doesn't count for anything, but when you are reared in a missionary's home, uh, you are put to the task. I believe his wife would share similar understanding, she being raised also by missionaries, uh, a world apart, however. Anyway, it is our honor and privilege to have them with us. Uh, last time I saw them, they kept track of this. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad, uh, but 12 years ago is the last time we were able to lay eyes upon each other. Uh, and the last time they were here, they stayed at my house, but I wasn't there. And I don't know if that means anything either. <laughs> but we're glad they could be with us tonight, and we can facilitate some of their schedule. They have a weird furlough this time that's been split into half, and or part. If they want to describe it to you, they can. If they don't want to, that's fine with me. But uh, they are in, a, in an odd circumstance that I have never seen before, and so I, I sort of feel for them in this. But regardless, we're glad they're with us tonight. And uh, Brother Kevin, if you'd come take over as you see fit. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Well, we are very glad to be here. It's, uh, it was just a window of opportunity that we had where we could leave the ministry in Germany. And we anticipated it somewhere in the middle of the summer during camps and uh, decided then to go ahead and book some tickets and just come over quickly. And uh, we're heading back again right after Thanksgiving. So we had a little time with our family right the first week we got here. And we'll have Thanksgiving then with my parents and whatever kids can be there that live here in the States. So these weeks that we are here, we're trying to fill as much as possible in the Lord's given grace. And we're thankful for Pastor Kern and others that have just uh, rearranged and worked us in. So we could come, and uh, we're just glad to be here with you tonight again. This is a little bit like home. If there's something like that for us, this is a, 
uh, ministry that we've been in touch with and ministered together with in all uh, since as long as I can remember. It's really that way. And I have even some childhood memories from being here. And so that's uh, special to our heart. We're glad Carol and I are here this time, though, alone. And uh, that is very odd. So we've always traveled with our children, but um, they're all grown up now. And now we have grandchildren. And uh, I don't want to get into too much of all that. I will watch the clock. And um, it won't be 10 o'clock tonight. It might be a little later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Before we go to the pictures, and I think I'll probably go to the pictures and share from the ministry. And then I do have something on my heart that I'd like to share from the Word. And we'll see how the time all works out. Um, Psalm 78 is something that was very dear to my heart as, as we were preparing and planning and thinking about furlough, it's always a little bit awkward for us, or at least I'll speak for myself as missionaries, when you come back and you're sharing what the Lord's been doing, because the Lord is using people, right? And so we're the people, and, um, and I always, and Carol too, we don't want you to be thinking about us, right? It's the Lord that is doing the work, and and Psalm 78 was something that the Lord laid on my heart in this sense here. Asaph is, it's the longest historical psalm like this here, uh, where he's explaining and teaching, instructing, exhorting um, the recipients to listen and to learn. And uh, I'm not going to expound it here, but he says, give, he, give ear and incline your ear in verse 1. And then he gives several different terms to my law to the words of my mouth in a parable and sayings of old. In other words, that which he's going to instruct, give ear, listen, pay attention, um, mark what I'm going to be saying. And he goes into then the different generations um, in verse 3, showing to the generation to come. In verse 5, making known to their children and um, generations to come and even to the children which should be born and declare them to their children. So we see here three generations, children, children to be born, and, and then the children that are born to them. So it's an extended uh, instruction that is to be going on. And what is he wanting that is to be taught? And that's where I just want us to lay our eyes on that for a moment. In verse 4, showing to the generation to come, what? The praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. And that is what our job is. He goes on to explain then that when that doesn't happen, then the, then the kids will go astray, spiritually astray. And then he goes on to explain and, and to remind of all that God has done from Moses all the way through David. He just, it's a long psalm and he recounts many, many different wonderful works that God had done in and among the people of Israel. And the point is that when we do that, that that is what God uses to keep his children close to him. It's that they see what God has done. And so as we're going about, that's our desire that as we share, that you look and you see what God is doing. Now you see it here. But as we as missionaries come to the States and report back, we have a desire that you would see, wow, this is wonderful, what God is doing in that field of harvest that he has in Germany. Now, we're in Germany. Other missionaries come from other places and so on. But we're just so thankful to be able to report back that God has been working and been working wonderfully and mightily among the German people. And these last seven years have been, as we see it, very fruitful. And we just can rejoice. And I hope you can rejoice with us as we look at some pictures, and I'll try and tell some stories, and I'll try not to get too long-winded so that it doesn't go too long tonight. Uh, I am taking my little clock that glows in the dark, so when you shut off the lights, I can still see what time it is and know that I should have already quit. So if you want to, yeah, that's great. So um, 30 years, and we, it's hard for us to believe as we were getting ready, and where's the count? Well, wow, 1992 we went, and it's 2022. So it's been a long time. The Lord has uh, given us in His grace the strength and joy to continue ministering there. I put this picture in just for this evening. I wonder if you know who that is. Those are Mommy and Daddy. Uh, 
we love my parents and the Lord has kept them with us. And actually, they've come every summer to Germany, except for one COVID summer where they weren't allowed to, and they were in the States crying. <laughs> but they love to come, and uh, here you see them. This is this summer. Um, we got them little red carts because camp's pretty big, and Daddy wouldn't use it at first, but then he got sick, and he, because of strength, needed it then. And, uh, but they have come, and they, they're always busy, always doing whatever they can to serve the Lord. That's the way you know them. That's the way we know them. They're a wonderful example to us. And um, Daddy, give him a shovel, give him a wheelbarrow and a rake, and he's happy. So <laughs> Lord, we just praise the Lord for them and the heritage that we have in them. Then this is a little bit of our kids, since none of them are here. On the left-hand side, you see the United States at the top. That's because those kids the Lord has brought back to the States, and they live here in, in America with their families. They all have a couple children now. And um, that's Eric and Eldon, and then the bottom, LaVon, with her husband in North Carolina, Florida, and in South Carolina. On the other side, on the right-hand side, those are the four other children, and the Lord has laid on their heart to remain in Germany. And Lorraine, you may remember, married a German young man, and uh, Eddie now also married Talita, and Evan at the bottom, and Lynette, they're both still um, single. And, uh, but they all want to stay in Germany and are living there. They're all involved in some way or shape with the ministry that the Lord has given to us. Uh, Eddie has just finished up his paramedics uh, position or training and uh, it hopes to move down to near where we live again in the church ministry and camp. So that's just a real quick, but just so you have a little idea of the family and uh, we're thankful that they all love the Lord and continuing on to serve him. Then the ministry, and I, we tried to figure out how to best share with what the Lord's been doing in the last seven years. So we have basically three different groups. The first one is a church ministry. Worked together with Stephen and Vicki King in uh, Gotha, in the church there. And um, there, the Lord has brought in a good amount of people. We see it at least that as about 80 people that regularly um, gather with us to worship the Lord there. These are just some of the pictures. I'm not going to tell any stories, but uh, of some of the families that are there and single people, we're thankful. We have the full uh, span. We have a nursery that's got about 12 little ones in it and uh, then all the way up to the old people and that would be Carol and myself. So we're um, thankful for that. And then so we have all the different kinds of aspects of the ministry that you're familiar with in a church the children's Sunday school and, and, and children's ministries, youth group, and um, then Bible studies for ladies. Um, they meeting now on Thursday evenings. They also have sometimes home Bible studies. Some of the ladies get together and are studying the Word together, uh, also in an evangelistic uh, manner, some. And then the men's prayer breakfast and, and Bible study that we have once a month on Saturday mornings and then often, often connect that with some sort of a further ministry, practical ministry, sometimes working at church or something similar to that. Then special meetings. Uh, we have special meetings like you would have special meetings. I just heard that you had um, Brother uh, Webb here. And uh, so we have different special meetings also. Um, and, and some are just topic related like marriage and family or... Um, uh, creation, evolution, that's a topic that we like to pick up time and again because it's, it's key to the ministry there. Counseling, or um, then also teachers' instruction, where we have, uh, for the Sunday school teachers and, and youth teachers and, and the like, instruction on how to do that better. Or a Bible seminar, and that would be like on a Friday night and then Saturday all day and then Sunday, we would have a special... Um, like we pick the book of Philippians or the letter to the Philippians and then they'll prepare by reading it and then we'll have sessions on that book of Philippians all the way through um, just to really uh, concentrate on one book of the Bible for a given amount of time. And then we have special outreaches too and I just want to highlight one evangelism outreach that, we, outreach that we've done that we found as a very effective ministry and that was with Lego. Um, and we'd never done that up until this occurred. We heard of a brother who had a whole trailer load of all kinds of kits and things like that, and we invited him, and he came in a DVBS, basically, a week long, um, and the kids would come, but instead of playing games, like soccer or whatnot, with the kids outside, 
we did Lego. And the nice thing about this was, you are, we had the church people all come. For every three children, there was one church adult there. And you would work with them for up an hour or so, working on whatever project that we're doing that day with them. Each day you had a new project for each little group. And the nice thing is you're standing there and you get into conversations with them and you really get to know them. So it's a wonderful way to really reach out to these uh, children and they loved it. The kids loved it. And I think American kids would love it too. So it's just an idea, but it's, it was a real blessing. And when people get saved, then also we have baptisms. And uh, since we don't have a baptistry in the church, we go out to a lake. We had a baptism um, just the beginning of August this summer. We try to do them in the warm months so we don't have to break the ice to get into the water. And um, had the joy of, of baptizing Fabienne. And uh, then you will see him in a moment in another picture. Then widow ministry, we have a couple widows. Husbands went to be with the Lord and helped them close up their business and move out of their house into assisted living and different situations, so reaching out to them. Then church weddings, I mention that because I'm asked to do other weddings too due to the many young people that I worked with, but these are in our church um, couples, and uh, Fabienne on the, on the right-hand side, and Lisa. Lisa comes out of a Christian home, that is her father and brother are saved, and uh, she witnessed to one of the young men that she knew f during school and after many years, he trusted the Lord as his Savior. And uh, that was about four or five years ago. And uh, then started coming to church, and he's really grown in the Lord, and they wanted to be married, and then we had the joy of marrying them at the beginning of September. Now, he comes out of a completely godless home. And his family was sitting there, the father, mother, um, grandmother, and great-grandmother, and you could see that they were definitely opposed to Christianity. And he was looking at his clock and sighing and all kinds of outward expressions of let's get this over with. But during the festivity, then afterwards, we drink coffee and have a cake and stuff like that and a program. Uh, he was sitting at the table with our daughter and son-in-law. And together they got into a very involved and great opportunity to share the gospel with him. And we're just praying that this family will also uh, be brought to the Lord Jesus. And um, But... Those are just some of the background, a couple little background stories. Then we also do counseling here a couple, uh, just a couple days before we came to the States. Actually, we've been working with them. And just the spiritual needs and, and problems that are there. And uh, so we have that ministry also in the church. Discipleship, uh, Danya, the young man who was in the church, left the church, and um, he wasn't saved, although he professed that, but then he left and uh, got into all kinds of sin. And uh, our doctor in our church had further education that he had to take in another town and uh, ended up driving every morning on the bus that this young man was riding to work. And so he went and sat down by him, but he did, Daniel didn't want to have anything to do with him. He was always trying to avoid him. But then Daniel got sick, very sick, and ended up in the hospital, and guess who his doctor was? And so the Lord continued to work in his life, and he came to know the Lord as his personal Savior. And really, the Lord changed his life completely. And I've been able to work with him in discipleship. We baptized him, and uh, he's really growing. He's, he's a wonderful testimony to the Lord. He's a real forthcoming witness. He just changed his job site and uh, shared right away how he was witnessing there, and the Lord opened up opportunities. And, and now, since we've come to the States, he, on his own, started to disciple uh, some of the young men in the church, and they've met a couple times and are reading the Bible together and studying it, and I was just excited to hear that. I didn't even give him that idea. He, <laughs> he thought of it on his own. So it's just uh, very thrilling to see and to see how the Lord is working in life. So that's the church ministry. Then the camp ministry is the second category, and um, here you just uh, will see some of the pictures of what the Lord has been doing. You remember the Lord gave us a facility in Germany in 2008, and... Um, We've been working on that, and since 2012, we've been having the summer camps there at Camp Impact. It's right in the middle of Germany, so that really lends itself to people coming from all over Germany, and we really have all our helpers and counselors and staff and workers and campers coming literally from all over Germany, from the North Coast all the way down to the Bavarian Alps um, and across all of Germany. We're thankful for that um, wonderful location that God gave us. 
Uh, it's 32 acres, not real big for an American mine, but for Germans it is. And uh, we're thankful it meets all the needs that we have and goes far beyond we would have ever thought or really dreamed. We cannot house the people, the campers, in the camp facilities that are there yet. So we have tents, and the, that has grown to be that we have 18 tents. They're like military, uh, you know, bigger tents. And we have bunk beds in there. Um, eight to nine people in each tent is the maximum capacity. And I just wanted to share this, because this is, again, a wonderful testimony to God's working. We went through the COVID crisis, right? And... Uh, that was a wonderful tool that God used in this ministry to bring more people to camp. So when we were growing every year in the years before that, at about 10 to 15 new additional campers each year, um, in 2019 we had 250 kids. 2020 was the first COVID year. We weren't even sure if we could do camp. And the Lord allowed us, and we just went ahead, and we prayed each whatever, and we ended up having 350 children that summer and teenagers. Uh, which was a huge leap from 250. The next summer, 450. And this last summer, again, 520. So it has really expanded beyond we, what we would have ever planned or thought or, or expected. And that in the midst of a crisis where everything around us was shutting down. So the Lord uh, wonderfully worked there. We're thankful for that um, growth that he gave. And our camps are much like anything you know here. As a matter of fact, we've been trained uh, by many of the camp ministries that you um, are familiar with here in the States. Oopsie, okay. I'm not sure what I did, or I'll just click on and see what happens. So maybe my cord is loose or something like that. that, I don't know. Misha, just a real short um, explanation. The war in the Ukraine you've heard of, and again, where you think everything is negative, and it is very problematic with that, but there were refugees leaving the Ukraine. They came to Germany, and many of the Christians took them in, mothers with their children and like that. Misha was one of those into a Christian home down in southern Germany. When camp season came, some of those parents offered to these kids, uh, some of those Christians offered to these kids to come to camp and sponsored them. He was one of them. And he came, and he'd already heard, going to church sometimes, about the Lord Jesus and sin. And, but at camp, then, he got saved. And we're just thankful to see some of those things happen, you know, in the midst of adversity and com uh, complications and problems, how God works right into that and, I believe, uses that whether it's COVID or war or whatever, uh, praise be to his name for his working in lives. Yeah. Did I miss one? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, this picture. So this, I just usually mention, we've had the joy, not just with increased uh, number of attendees, but also salvation decisions. And Germans are slow to make decisions. They think everything through for a while. That's why our teen camp isn't just a week. It actually goes from Monday through the following Tuesday, because we just saw one year we did it shorter, but we saw that the kids needed time. They think about things and uh, assess, and they, they don't go to make a quick decision. But anyway, this past summer we had the joy of seeing 30 kids and teenagers make a profession for the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a lot. I mean, for us at least, that's a lot. And we were really thrilled. We don't pressure them, but we try to help them understand this is an important question. Don't just leave it laying at the side. And not making a decision is also a decision because you're still in the uh, sinful condition that you were in. So, okay, Bisha. And then just a picture of some of the kids. One of our emphases is at Camp 2 to teach kids how to get into the Word and study it. Almost all those kids don't go to any Christian schools. There are a few in Germany, but not many. So, um, and some of them come from very small ministries and struggling so we've seen a need to help them learn how to get into the Word and find the answers for life uh, that God has given them in the Word of God. And we even have one camp in the spring, the Phenomen, that is geared specifically towards kids that trust and know the Lord Jesus Christ, but helping them to understand how to study the Bible. Then some of the gifts that God has made possible, we have this Waldwiese. 
Now, it's just interesting here. Zoning rules made it very difficult to try and get somehow a soccer field. And long story short, the lady told us, you cannot have a soccer field, but I will allow you, so environmentally lady, I will allow you to have a forest meadow. <laughs> so we leveled the thing, and the Lord gave us a Christian contractor that brought in the machines, and two summers long we worked on it. And this is our forest meadow. Now, we're allowed to put out soccer goals. We're allowed to do all, everything that you would do on a soccer field. Please just don't call it soccer field. Call it a forest meadow. So we have a beautiful forest meadow. And the Lord has provided many, many things, but these are some bikes that he provided and some ket cars that he provided. And we're just so thankful for what the Lord has been doing. This is our game room. Oopsie, there it goes again. Um, and uh, we have a wonderful area there for the kids to... See, I don't know, honey, if it, you just probably better just, yeah, we'll just see what they can see. This is the slip and slide, super soak, soccer, whatever. Uh, it's basically something a young man saw and had a burden for, then he did a GoFundMe and donated it to camp this year. And it's a huge tarp, basically, with uh, pillows all the way around it and soccer goals. And then you put down a lot of water and a lot of soap, liquid soap. And then you let the kids go in there barefoot and play soccer. And you've got a wonderful um, recipe for a lot of fun. Oh, I forgot the nurses. And you need a couple nurses. <laughs> and then when you have a lot of campers, you need a lot of workers too. And the Lord provided those. This summer, we just counted up 134 volunteer workers that came and worked at camp. Um, and we run all our camps basically all on volunteer staff and uh, we're thankful for those that came. Some came for a week, some came for a couple weeks, some came for the whole summer. Some even canceled their jobs to come and work there. Here you see 19 counselors that we had on one uh, camp week that was especially um, one of the bigger ones. And to get those all working together that they don't just think that they're coming there to be you know, a little policeman or something like that, that they understand they're there to counsel from the Word of God. We have a training time. And uh, that goes from Wednesday night all the way through Sunday, uh, Saturday night. And uh, we've been having over 100 um, people come and attend that in a time of, of real training. Manuel used to come as a kid to camp, then went to Brazil as a missionary, and then came back and now is the leader, the director of a tract um, printing agency. And um, he came to me one day and just said what a blessing the camps had been when he was a kid that he was so thankful for that and that he wanted that to be advanced and that he would try and help that. And uh, so he gives, but also he brought his own kids now. And there you see him also, he came and uh, worked in the kit camp kitchen too, just uh, to see how the longevity there the Lord has been blessing also. Then we have other camps besides the summer camps. Um, we have winter camps in the Swiss Alps and uh, music camp in uh, June and other young adult camps that uh, the Lord has allowed us also to have. Then there's the uh, facility needs work, and uh, you know that, you've heard about that. I just wanted to mention that, not much, but the Lord has really blessed that aspect too. We're right now working on this big building. When it's done, it'll have 120 beds and, um, and meeting rooms, and so we're looking forward to that. We're hoping that 2024 we'll be able to uh, open up a couple of the levels. There are five levels, and we're hoping to get three at least going. And the workers that come are from all over. They're volunteer helpers, young and old, and even some from the States, and you know uh, we've had even from this church too. <laughs> so, and then the extended ministry finally. So I didn't know how else to term this, but the Lord in the past term that we've been over there has opened up new opportunities for us, and that is in the off-season I'm invited to minister in various ministries, and, um, and we're just thankful for that. These are some of the pastors that we've gotten to know. And um, so between camps, I've usually got at least two weekends a month that I can be gone, or more actually, but I, I limit it to two weekends a month um, to be gone. Here's a pastor's retreat that I've gone to a couple times to preach the word and encourage the men there. Um, and then evangelistic meetings. Uh, sometimes small churches, sometimes big churches, but just whatever the Lord opens up. Uh, men's retreats. Uh, this was one that we had recently um, over in Halva. And then I was also invited to preach at a, and teach at a National Youth Workers Conference seminar. 
together with another man of God, and uh, there were about 350 um, youth pastors from around Germany. And then young adult meetings, churches often have a, like a Saturday, Sunday uh, youth retreat at the church, and they've asked me uh, to come and, and preach at those. And then in closing, just as we go back again, our ministry, we were just talking about this before, but training the next generation. And uh, these are some of the men that we're working with, and we really would appreciate if you would pray with us uh, that the Lord would really draw these young men out of um, the nooks and crannies and uh, give them a heart that is willing and prepared to serve the Lord. Um, so, oops, skipped there again, but... Um, we do have prayer cards, but they're not coming until tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll be mailing a stack, and then you can come get them. Uh, but we would covet your prayers for us uh, as we go back. You know this verse in English and German, Ob ihr nun esst oder trinkt oder sonst etwas tut, tut alles zur Ehre Gottes. And that is our desire, that as we uh, continue on, as long as the Lord gives us strength and, and uh, ministry, that we would be faithful to bringing glory to his name. So those are the pictures, and um, time always goes quicker than you th would like it to. I, will, I, I would entertain a couple questions. If, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to uh, respond or try and answer those. Anything that came to your mind as you saw the pictures? I know I was jogging pretty quickly. Um, anything that you would think? Yes. 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 No, you know, they all have to learn English, but no, our ministry is entirely in, in German, actually. Yeah. What's the most prominent religion there? Is it, is it, is it, uh, Atheism. <laughs> Atheism. I don't believe in anything or I don't believe in God. So that, and in East Germany anyway, um, that's really... Um, heavily that mindset, uh, but in Germany, actually right now, during COVID and after COVID, there's been a huge exodus that's uh, leaving the Lutheran church. So when a kid's born, his parents have to sign him up. Are you Lutheran or Catholic? What do you, and the kid's declared that, and that's what he is in, uh, until he chooses something else, and uh, they've never had an exodus like this, and, and during COVID, it's just kind of like, they all said, why am I even in the Lutheran church, and they're just leaving. Yes. Good. Anything else? Yes. Sure. <laughs> we'll see what the Lord's given. He's given us a really warm fall, hasn't he? So, you know, that's, that's part of the issues and problems, and we're, we, we try not to focus on it. So whatever the Lord allows, he's going to allow to everybody, right? And our German chancellor said, well, I hope, I hope we get through the winter. And the media like says, you hope? You know, what is that for the leader of the country to, to put out? Well, he kind of realized what he did after that. But um, sure, we used to get 90% of our gas from Russia. So that's changed. They had shut down almost all our nuclear power plants. That changed. They had shut down almost all our coal uh, energy um, uh, making uh, plants. And they've re brought online again, um, I think four we read, didn't we, Carol? So uh, the environmentalists are have to step back a little bit and, uh, because Germany is dependent on energy, right? Yes? As, as far as your building with 120 rooms or so, um, were you having trouble getting people or money to finish the job? Which, uh, what do you need more of there? Well, <laughs> uh, you, you kind of need both both of those, money and, and, and people. So, but we have, in, in two weeks, there's another crew of these churches that I go and preach in. That's also, it's just what the Lord's doing, right? So I get into these churches, and they hear about the burden, and kind of a side effect is they do then say, well, what are you doing? And oh, and, and so like we have a, a church that has really um, taken a burden for the ministry, and every year, I say every year, they send a, a crew to work at the camp, on physical projects, and in the summer, we had this summer probably 10 uh, people out of their church, just out of their church that came and worked, and some for a couple weeks. So, 
Yeah, we're, we're thankful. We take the approach, the Lord will give as he wants it to progress. So he'll give the money and the workers as he wants it to progress. We do have all the permissions, and so that's not an issue anymore as it had been. Good, yes. Okay. So, most of the kids bring their Bibles, even if they're unsaved, it says on the registration, bring a Bible if you have one. And there's always some that don't bring Bibles, so we do have Bibles that they can borrow, or if a counselor thinks they would um, not waste it, I don't know how to say that really eloquently, but that they would want to Bible, then they will we'll make sure they can, they can get one, yes. So that... Good. Good thoughts? Yes? It is. It is. The devil's got his strongholds, and, you know, the people are, uh, they have this alibi, well, evolution. But um, what we found, and if you take time to talk and to listen, to listen, so you let them talk, and I'm, I'm learning this myself, this is actually kind of a little bit my burden of what I'd like to preach on. Maybe that's a good transition, right? So um, you listen and, and then ask questions, and they start to think evolution is not really a viable scheme or whatever you want to call it, theory. So I'll just say this by way of introduction. Uh, I, had, I had an operation on my leg, and uh, the doctor that worked on me, I'd been witnessing to him while I was in the hospital, and then at the end I said, I'd like to talk to you if you don't mind. You know I'm a Christian. I've been sharing that a little bit, but I'd like to talk to you in depth personally. Would you be interested? He turned around, and I thought he was walking out, but he went and got a chair and brought it over to my bedside, and we talked for about, about 45 minutes. And it was a real deep conversation, I mean spiritual. So one of the things I said was, I said, you know, you know a lot more about the body than I do. I mean, I look at my hand, and that's my illustration. I look at my hand, and I think, this thing didn't happen by, happen, by accident. I mean, this is amazing. And I said, and you know much more. Do you think that you happened by accident? I mean, you know all this about the body. And he said, well, I'm an atheist. I grew up in Yena. And, I, and, and then he goes, but I, I, I've thought about that too, and I think it can't be really. You know, this is a, this is a really died in the wood, wood of atheist. He, did, he never wanted to think about God. So we got into a very good conversation about sin and everything. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't trust the Lord yet that I know of. But, um, yeah, it's an alibi. If we can, Pastor said I could take about 10, 12 minutes. I'd like to. I really, there's something on my heart, and, and I'd like to share it with you, and I'll try and, 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 and sweep it quickly and bring it together. But um, when I was in the hospital about my leg, I asked the Lord to, to work in my own heart. I, did, I, was, I was put aside from the ministry for a while. I had to have my foot up and everything. And, um, and he brought something to my attention that I'd like to share with you tonight. And I've been sharing this as I'm going along just because I preached actually on personal evangelism for about a year in our church. So we all know evangelism is important, right? I mean, I think we're all going to nod our heads on that and say, yes, we know that we need to be evangelistically active and, um, and that we need to have evangelistic meetings and, and, and that. But the question I want you to ask yourself tonight is, where are your gospel shoes? Where are your gospel shoes? And I want this to be really personal. So we have little grandkids, right? They come and visit. What do they do? When they get to grandma's house, off go the shoes, right? Somewhere, wherever. Mom comes, time to go home, 
and it's time to find those, go those shoes, right? Sometimes you don't find them so quickly or whatever, they're somewhere. So there are times where we put our shoes off in our life. But when we look at Ephesians chapter 6, we see the armor of the Christian, right? All those elements. And what does Paul remind us of there? Put on the whole armor. And what the Lord brought to my attention is, now the reason I went into the ministry, or one of the things God really used was, the awareness and understanding that souls are, you can't express how valuable a single soul is, right? I mean, to me, as I, I was going to become an air traffic controller, and I wanted to give money to missions and others and, and so on, but as the Lord worked in my own heart and helped me understand, every soul is so important. Being an air traffic controller, anybody can do that. They're lost people. And I thought, I, I want to give myself to that. And then as I looked upon my life and I go and preach evangelistic meetings, I work in camps and I counsel people and so on like that, I'm, I'm doing a lot of evangelistic things, but you know what I started to become aware of is the armor that we're to wear is not just we pick and choose and sometimes we have parts on and sometimes we don't, but the Holy Spirit directed the Apostle Paul to say, put on the whole armor of God. And I was asking myself, are there times when I'm not putting on, as it says in verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So your feet are laced up. They've, they've got these shoes on that the Romans had, and we all know that from DVBS or Sunday school or something, that their shoes were special. It's one of those things that gave the Roman soldier the distinct advantage over the other armies. They had these shoes that had spikes in them, right? And so when they were out there in the battlefield, they were prepared because they didn't just have a good sword and a good shield and other good things, but their feet had to be planted, solid, ready to withstand the blows that were coming or ready to be able to wield the strength of that sword. Now you saw that slip and slide, right? What's the problem there? You don't have a good footing. You can be an awesome soccer player, but since you don't have a good footing, <laughs> you're kind of on the same level as everybody else. You can't get to the ball. And when you do get there, you can't stop. And it's just slip and slide all over the place. The footing is a key. And I wonder if we understand that this part of the armor of God is vital Where are your gospel shoes? Now, we get ready in the morning, right? You get up in the morning, you shower, you eat breakfast, ham and eggs, I don't know what, oatmeal, you know, you, you put it in, right? Get your energy up, right? Then you put on your clothes and jacket and whatnot, and, then, and I don't know where you're going. You're going maybe to, uh, if you're a businessman, you're going to give a report maybe, and you look, do I have my report? Do I have my notes? Do I have, I'm a teacher? Do I have my, my lesson plans or the tests? Or wherever you're going, you're thinking about what you're going to be doing, and you get, you accumulate everything, you get it all ready to go out the door, right? And your wife goes, it's going to rain. Oh, grab the umbrella. Now when you're getting ready to go, are you thinking of the armor of God that you're supposed to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Make it personal. We get everything else ready. Are we ready to share the gospel? And I believe that begins right here or here. You start thinking about the opportunities you're going to have. You start thinking about the people you're going to meet. You start thinking about, do I have materials maybe to hand on a little booklet, a tract? But are you even thinking like this? Are your feet prepared to share the gospel? Well, I venture to say that oftentimes not. And I had to, I had to, 
I had to accept that and realize that and confess that to the Lord myself. It's not that I'm that I didn't care. It's just you get wrapped up in all, you're going to take your car to the shop. You're thinking, do I have the papers? Do I have the whatever? You're going to the store. You're going to whatever the many things. And you're often thinking about all kinds of other things. But you're not thinking about this part of the armor of God. And that's not maybe just an exception. That's maybe even something that is habitual. It happens a lot of the time. Oh, when the evangelistic meetings roll around, you have some flyers. When some special occasion comes around, sort of like when you go hunting, then you go find your hunting boots, right? Because you need them now for the hunting season. But the rest of the year, they're somewhere, I don't know where. Your wife probably knows where. And that's how it is sometimes with those shoes. You have special shoes for special occasions, but this is not for special occasions. This is all the time. Do we have this understanding that the Lord wants us to be prepared at all times to share the gospel. And I'll just give you some illustrations real quickly. The Lord Jesus came from glory to earth. To what? To die on the cross. Wonderful. We all know this. We understand this. It's true. But that's not the only thing he did, right? When he was on earth, he was here to reach out to the lost people, right? I'll just remind you. When the disciples said, no, don't, 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 don't let the little kids come to him, what did the Lord say? Oh, yeah, bring them. And time and again you see the Lord Jesus just reaching out. He was thronged about with people. There was a little guy. His name was? And he couldn't get to the Lord, right? So what did he do? He climbed up in a? For the Lord, he wanted to. And as the Savior passed that way, he, hey, he looked. He looked up in the tree. There were all these people around him. He had a, a view for the needs of men and souls, the individuals. And he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm coming to your house. And were all the people excited about it? Oh, no, it says they murmured in Luke chapter 19. It's interesting, that song is very close to what, what Scripture says. They murmured, they complained. And he said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save. And we're to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and be like him. What are you doing? What am I doing? I mean, every day. Are we seeking to reach out? Now, we can't save people, but we can lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we have a vision for it? Do we see the need? And are we preparing for it? He went and called the disciples. What did he tell them? I will make you fishers of men. Uh, we need to visit, we need to go to church, we need to get together, we need to have our church Thanksgiving dinners, we need to have our fellowship, we need to have our Bibles, we need to have all that. Don't misunderstand me. But we need to also be fishers of men. We need to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need to be seeking the lost. What are we doing are we really burdened for the lost? Not just on an occasion, but really every day. Ask yourself honestly, when was the last time you had a serious conversation with someone about their soul? When was the last time you didn't feel prepared for that? And you went home, and you sat down, and you wept before the Lord. You prayed and asked the Lord to help you to know how to reach out with the gospel of peace to this person. And you wanted to be prepared. When was the last time as you anticipated meeting someone, you said, okay, tonight I'm going to spend time preparing for that? In prayer? 
Maybe in the study of the Word. Maybe getting some truths together that will help him to understand. Maybe to knock down some of those obstacles, alibis that he has. Are we prepared with the gospel of peace? The Lord gave us a command, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's not just the missionaries. That's not just the evangelists. That's not just the pastors. And they can't get the job done. It's the body of Christ. All of them putting on the gospel shoes. Paul says further in Colossians 1.28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. The individual. Each individual. The little guy up in the tree. Now ask yourselves, and we're almost done, ask yourself, who is that individual? Just think of one. One lost person that you know that pastor doesn't. Or at least that you have the connection to. Are you prepared to go and share the gospel? In closing, I just want you to look at, you don't need to look, but in Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, Paul then, after he gives the whole armor of God, he mentions one more thing. Listen. Listen. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me. He's telling them, pray always, right? With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. It's pretty heavy. Really praying. That, that, that's really praying. And he goes on, and not just for all saints, and for me. And now notice what? That utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak, what? Boldly, as I ought to speak. Paul, if I think of the evangelist of all times, it's Paul. And Paul is saying, pray for me. I'm asking you, please don't give up. Keep praying. Pray for the other saints. And pray for me, that I may open my mouth boldly. Twice he says that. Well, if there's one person I would have thought that didn't need to ask that, I would have thought Paul. I mean, he, he's an incredible evangelist. And yet he's asking these believers to pray for him. Now, in closing, I say that three times. I really want to get there. But I want you to take this home with you tonight. How much are you praying for the other saints in this assembly? That they would be bold in proclaiming the gospel. The Lord wants us all to be fishers of men and to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and to go out there into this world, into the darkness, into the wickedness of this world and share the good news. And I'm sharing this tonight because the Lord really pricked my heart on this. That when I go out, that I'm prepared that when I think of my brothers and sisters in Christ, that I'm praying for them, that the Lord would make them bold. And I told you about Daniel, and I pray for him. We pray. We've we got a little partnership. We're praying for each other, that we would be bold, that we would seize the opportunities that God gives to us, that we would really optimize. We're all the time thinking about optimizing in all areas of life. How about in giving the gospel? It's a wonderful privilege we have. May the Lord may really quicken our, our hearts and our spirits and our, that we're excited to be prepared. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you just for these couple minutes.
but that we could allow the Holy Spirit to use your word to stir our, our thoughts and our hearts to do that wonderful task that you've given us to do, not just on occasion, a special occasion, but really to have this as a, a part of our everyday thinking and passions and seeking opportunities, that we have our pocket always attract, that we have our mind and our heart thinking of others that are out there sharing the gospel or ourselves seeking to take advantage of those opportunities you give to us. Thank you for these dear, dear brothers and sisters in Christ that love you and want to live for you. Help us all to be renewed in our passion to share the gospel. I pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And all, uh, and I trust that as you made it personal, uh, that at that same moment he laid on your heart the face of that one who you know you ought to talk with or talk to, or those several faces that you need to talk with and talk to. And by the way, I know there's some deacons who'd be willing to go with you if you need. Uh, a partner, or there's a pastor at this place who would go with you uh, to serve alongside. This is, we're not just uh, sitting sour. I was listening to a man preach about how many come and sit, and when they sit, they, they believe they're serving. And he said, we know we call it the service, but that's probably the most wrong term we could ever use. For service begins when we go out the door. Uh, and uh, we, we've just got our ears filled, right? He asked us to lay our eyes on it. Did you hear that expression? Got some good Germanic language given to us in the plain English. We're to lay our eyes on it. Around here we say have both our ears open. We have both our ears open. And I trust that your ears and in the inner man were listening Thank you, brother, for your time here at the pulpit. We're going to take a love offering and uh, ask God to uh, direct you in this giving. I had already asked you to consider if you only had enough for one of the offerings to wait for this one. And uh, so we'll ask our men to come, and we'll pray and ask God to bless uh, in our giving for a missionary and uh, for the cause of Christ. And Heavenly Father, as we now uh, partake uh, again in, in ministry, as we have a, a chance to uh, show our appreciation for the, the gospel and our Savior, as it is uh, being uh, uh, propagated and promulgated and preached uh, boldly in uh, the center of the country of Germany, I pray that you take this little bit that we have and multiply it again for, for the use of the gospel. Lord, may we all be found faithful and uh, careful in our love and our witness for you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
appropriate to end with praise the Lord. We're going to ask you to stand and we'll dismiss in prayer. I'm sure if you want to speak with the missionary or his wife or both, they'll be a little bit available uh, for your time. And you can ask maybe some questions that are still on your heart lingering. And uh, let them know you'll be praying for them. And when the prayer cards come, we'll use them. Meanwhile, the ones that we have from the past, they still work. They really will. And Heavenly Father, as we'll be dismissing now, we ask that you uh, bless us with safety as we go to our appointed places, uh, that we would have protection, that we would have uh, your blessing. And then as we've had our ears uh, affected by the message of the hour, that we would be more faithful, more passionate, more careful about those souls that are about us. That is true, Lord. There's nothing more valuable than the soul of a man. May we have our eyes laid upon that thought as we go our different ways. Thank you for this work that is in Germany, that you've allowed us to have a small, uh, tiny part in it, and that we've been able to hear of some things. Bless these as they will soon be headed back. May their time yet with their family here be enjoyable. And then as they head home to uh, f find that place that brings the greatest rest where you're supposed to be working. Uh, bless them and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name and all of God's people say, amen. amen. Good evening, God bless you.